Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Galatians 5 today. Uh, as you're turning there, let us go to the Lord in prayer before we start in. Father, we, Lord, we come before you today, and uh, Lord, as always, the task is great. As we approach your word and attempt to faithfully consider what it has to say to our lives. Father, as you've reminded me throughout this week, those words that uh, you spoke through your servant, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where he said, well, we have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we might understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, Lord, for there is little of that here today. But in those things taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people, which is our prayer, Lord, that you and your Spirit would speak to these spiritual men and women who have gathered here today to worship you in spirit and truth. The apostle went on to say, but the person without the Spirit doesn't receive what comes from God's spirit. And Lord, that is a reality that is not lost on us because to them it is foolishness. He's not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. So Lord, we know that our enemy, the devil, is gonna attempt to confuse and conflict, to distract and distort the things that are spoken today through your spirit particularly in the lives of those who have yet to be transformed by the power of your gospel. And as a result, remain blinded to the things of the Spirit. So, Father, I just pray right now that you would open their eyes and their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would open all of our eyes and our hearts. Father, for those who are spiritual in this place, I pray that you would empower them to grasp the significance of, of the role of your spirit in their life and how it works in their lives. Lord, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So far in our sermon series, Surprise the World, we have been considering the different things from Michael Frost's book, which is titled Surprise the World. Many of you are going through it in your small groups. If you are not in a small group, if you are not going through it, um, I would encourage you, it's a great little book. It's got five little habits in it that we can all practice and participate in that help us to win our neighbors and our families and uh, people we work with to the Lord. In week one, we talked about what it means to live questionable lives, not questionable lives in a bad way, but questionable lives in the sense that people would look at us and go, there's something different about that man. There's something different about that woman. There's something different about that family, questionable in the sense that they would want to have it and what that looks like. In week two, we talked about the importance of being people who bless others. We all took the challenge to go out and bless three people that week, and I would encourage you to continue that challenge, to continue to bless three people each week. The following week, we talked about the importance of eating together, and we looked at all the different ministry and conversations that happened around a table in the New Testament, or as many of them as we could that day, and the importance of leveraging our time at the table for the glory of God and for the sake of the gospel. And we challenge you to eat with people, and to not just eat with them, but to use that time at the table to have the conversations that God wants you to have. And then last week, we talked about learning, the importance of being people of God's word, um, learning from the Lord every day, learning from the Word of God, and spending time with God. This week, we're going to talk about listening, specifically what it means to listen to the Holy Spirit. Not just listen to the Holy Spirit, but what it means to live in step with the Spirit of God. I promise you this, if you develop all these habits that we've been talking about, but particularly this one, if you develop a spiritual habit of listening to and living with the Spirit of God, you are going to surprise the world. I got one amen on that. Let me say that again. If you develop a spiritual habit of listening to 
and living with the Spirit of God, staying in step with the Spirit of God, you are certain to surprise the world. You cannot, there is no way you can live in the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, and not surprise the world. Because the Spirit has been surprising the world for a long time. For, for those of you who know me, you know my brain works in some really funny ways. Um, I got an amen on that. Thanks, Vince. <laughs> for example, every time I hear this one country song come on the radio, it makes me think of the Holy Spirit. The song has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It's not at all a spiritual song, at all. But, but this song, it came out years ago. Um, they don't play it as much anymore, but it still comes on every now and then. And every time it comes on, I, I just, for whatever reason, my brain thinks about the Holy Spirit. It's a song called Better Together by a guy by the name of Luke Combs. And um, like most country songs, it's, it's a love song. It's not about God or the Spirit or anything like that. But the big idea in the song is this, that some things just go better together. And that's true. The song starts off, I'm going to give you a little bit of the song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I'm just going to read the lyrics to you. I'll, I'll spare you the singing. But, but here are some of the lyrics. You'll recognize it. And these are things that go better together. A 40 horsepower Johnson on a flat bottom metal boat, Coke cans and BB guns, barbed wire and old fence posts, an eight-point buck in autumn and freshly cut cornfields, one arm out the window and one hand on the wheel. Some things just go better together and probably always will. Like a cup of coffee and a sunrise, Sunday drives and time to kill. Can you think of some things that go better together? He left a few things off the list that I can think of. But there are things in life that just go better together, aren't there? I bet you can think of some. Do you know what, you know what else goes better together? And this is why this song makes me think about the Holy Spirit. You know what goes better together? You and the Holy Spirit. When you're in step together, when you're walking together, you're better together. That's a real match made in heaven, as the song would say. You and the Holy Spirit walking in step together. That's what I want to talk to you about today, walking in the Spirit, living our lives in a way that is listening to and staying in step with the Spirit of God. It should be no surprise to us that if we want to surprise the world, we're going to have to be people who listen to the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, as I mentioned a moment ago, has been surprising the world for a really long time. We could even go back in the Old Testament and see examples of this, but there's a great example in Acts 2 that we're all pretty familiar with. And uh, it, it just it puts it right in our face how surprising the Spirit of God is to the world. In Acts 2, at Pentecost, when the Spirit comes, listen to what it says in chapter 2, verse 7 of the book of Acts. It begins by saying, they were astounded and amazed, surprised, saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Perithians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. And then it says it again in verse 12, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, ah, they're just drunk on new wine. They were astounded and perplexed. The Spirit of God surprised the world on that day. Talk about surprising the world. So surprised were they, the only explanation some of them could come up with is, ah, they must be drunk. I don't know, I, I mean... I've heard, I've heard some people who are drunk speaking a different language, but it wasn't a language anybody could understand. These people were all able to understand them. I don't know how new wine could make you do that. As you walk through the remainder of the book of Acts, you can't help but see how the Holy Spirit continues to surprise the world through the acts of the apostles. Today we're going to take a big chunk of scripture, Galatians 5, 16 through 26, and 
I'm going to point out three basic things we have to understand about this if we want to live in step with the Spirit of God. But let's read it all in its context, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of your flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things, he says, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We know this text. It's a familiar text to many of us, but we primarily know it as a text about the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we normally talk about when we come to this text. That's indeed a very powerful portion of Scripture. It applies to every believer in every one of our lives. I'm not saying it's not important, but today I want us to look at the entire section, everything that's around the fruits of the Spirit. And I want us to see three things, three specific things that we have to deal with if we really want to be people who walk in the Spirit. The big idea for today actually comes straight out of the verse. The big idea is this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The first thing I I want you to see about this, that if we're going to live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit, is this, we have to deal with this very uncomfortable reality that that this text mentions all throughout it, and that is what I call our filthy flesh. Do Do you know and understand that your flesh is filthy, nasty, gross, stinky? And that's not just because some of y all hadn't taken a shower all week. You know, you all have this problem with your children. I have two kids in my house. I'm not going to name names. It's hard enough to be a preacher's kid as it is without dad spilling all your dirty laundry and stankiness out on the stage. But I got two that don't want to shower. And they're like, Dad, why, why do I need to shower? I did it three days ago. I said, because you stink. That's why. <laughs> you know, go get in. But that's not the kind of stink we're talking about. That's not the kind of filth we're talking about. The kind of filth and stink we're talking about today, it's a different kind. It's a spiritual kind. It's a a kind of filth that water and soap can't wash off. It's a kind of filth that no shower is going to fix. Our text says it like this in verse 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of your flesh, your filthy flesh, For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, because it's filthy. And the spirit desires what is against the flesh, because it's pure and it's clean. And then he says these two, they're they're opposed to each other. The flesh and the spirit are in this battle. And what the result is, is many times we end up doing what we don't want to do. But he says if you're led by the spirit... You're not under the law. Now, the verb here, walk by or keep in step with, it's actually a military term that means to be drawn up in line. It means to be drawn up in a row or drawn up in order. It means to kind of come together and stand at a attention. It's a military term. And, and the idea, the thought here that, that Paul is getting at is that we as believers, those who are in the spirit, we march to the beat of a different drum. We don't march to the beat of our own drum. We don't march to the beat of the culture's drum. We we don't march to the beat of the chaos around us drum because we're walking with the Spirit. We're going to look different. 
we, we're going to look out of step with the world. We're going to look out of step with the culture. We're going to look out of step with other people around us who are not in the Spirit. Because if we're walking in Spirit, what we're doing is we're not embracing the desire of our filthy flesh. We're not embracing the desires that our flesh constantly wants to run to. In Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8, Paul talks at length about his own struggle with the, the filthy flesh and how the Spirit plays into it. We don't have time to go through it detail, uh, in detail with, with everything he says there, but I want to just read you some passages of things he talked about because I think it relates to us. And, and as I told one lady at the end of the first service today, I, I want you to know you're not alone in this struggle. We struggle here. It is a struggle. Even the Apostle Paul mentions it was a struggle for him. Look at Romans 7, 15 through 25, for example. I know this is a long portion, but just listen to him as he's pouring his heart out here. He says, For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do. But I do what I hate. Now, if I, if, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good so now I'm no longer the one doing it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good thing that I want to do, but I practice the evil thing that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I'm no longer the one who does it, but it's the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law, when I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self I delight in God's law, but, these, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, his flesh, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body, his flesh. And then he says this in verse 24, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? It's a good question. I love verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Have you, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt that opposition between your filthy flesh and the spirit of God? You know what's right. You know what's holy. You know what would please God in the moment. You know what you should do, but for some reason, it feels like you almost have no power to do what is right. And so you keep on doing what is wrong. That's not walking in the spirit. That's walking in the flesh. In the next chapter, Paul continues and he says, the victory from our filthy flesh is found in walking in the spirit and staying in step with the spirit. Again, more we could read, but let me just read 10 verses to you out of Romans chapter eight, starting in verse one. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God for that. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. Remember, they're opposed to each other. Do you see? He's building that. In everything we're reading here, this is all opposed to each other. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. From these two passages, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, this is probably like a 40-week sermon series right here in 20 verses. But from these two passage, passages, we need to learn something that's very important. And here's the one thing I want you to learn from this. We can't walk in the flesh and the spirit at the same time. 
Honestly, this is one of the biggest problems in our world right now. It's one of the biggest problems in the church right now. Everyone wants to have their cake and eat it too. They want to walk in their filthy flesh and they want to enjoy all the pleasures and desires that their filthy flesh can give them. And at the same time, they want to to claim the purity of Christ for the salvation of their souls. Many have convinced themselves that they can live for Christ but continue to walk in the flesh. But church, that's not how it works. Your flesh is filthy and constantly working to knock you out of step with the Spirit. You're either walking in the flesh or you're walking in the Spirit. You can't walk in both worlds. They're opposed to each other. Jesus said this himself. These are the very words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 63. He says, the Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some among you who don't believe. I want you to remember that. Jesus said the flesh doesn't help at all. The filthy flesh doesn't help at all. Turn to your neighbor and say the flesh doesn't help at all. The flesh doesn't help at all, y'all. Not one bit. It's just filthy, nasty stuff that gets you out of step with the spirit. My friends, if we want to keep in step with God, if we want to walk with Jesus, if we want to walk in the Spirit, we have got to realize that our filthy flesh is a major problem. See, what happens is many people repent of their sins. They say a prayer, they come down to the front, they fill out a card. Some of them even come and get baptized. You should all come and get baptized, by the way. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. A little plug for that. But but we do these things and we repent And we run from the flesh for a period of time. For some people, it's a day or two. For some people, it's a week or two. For some people, it's a month or two. For some people, it's a year or two. Other people, it might be a decade or two. We run from the flesh, and we're super serious, and we're reading our Bibles, and we're going to church, and and the Spirit is a priority, and we're living in the Spirit. We're trying to grasp it, and we're trying to get it. But somewhere along the way, for many of us, far too many of us, we return to the filthy flesh. You want to know why? Because the filthy flesh is a powerful mistress that is always calling you back. Saying, just come back for a little while. Just come back over here. Remember how good it felt? Remember how awesome it was? You're saved now anyway. I mean, you can come over here for a little while. It's not going to hurt nothing. Except that it gets you out of step with the Spirit, which is kind of a big deal. The believers in Galatia struggled with this same issue Paul addressed it with them in multiple places. You can go back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, and and it's the same basic issue, the same basic concept of what's going on here. I'll just read the first four verses. He said, you foolish Galatians, who's cast a spell on you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? In fact, it was for nothing. That's that's a powerful question. A powerful challenge. After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? Another translation puts it like this. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? The answer is no, you can't be. Like many in our culture today, these believers had started well, but at some point, for some reason, many of them had fallen out of step with the Spirit, and they'd gotten back into their filthy flesh. You see, walking in the Spirit means forsaking our filthy flesh. It means forgoing our worldly desires. It means forgetting about our foolish fantasies. Instead, we should focus on and put our full attention and full effort into following Christ, knowing Christ, learning Christ, being about his kingdom and his mission and his gospel, staying in step with the Spirit of God. Church, only a fool thinks he can walk in the flesh and the Spirit at the same time. It can't happen. If you want to walk with the Spirit, you have to kill that filthy flesh every single day, sometimes moment by moment. And you've got to learn to listen to the Spirit of God, not your flesh. 
If we want to live by the Spirit, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. Point number two is this, two words, overwhelmingly obvious. This isn't rocket science, figuring out what walking in the Spirit looks like and and what walking in the flesh looks like. It's, It's really overwhelmingly obvious I've used this example I'm about to share with you before some years ago, but I'm going to use it again because I think it's a, it's a good one. It's a g- great way to show how overwhelmingly obvious this is. By show of hands, by the way, this is a test. I'm going to grade it. Um, but it's not a trick test. It's not a trick question. There's, there's no trick answer here. Uh, everybody in the first service got 100 on the test. I, I have a feeling you all will too. Okay? So not, not a trick question. By show of hands... How many of you have ever killed an elephant? I don't think you have. Um, This young man up here looks too young. Anybody? No? Nobody's killed an elephant? Nobody's got an elephant mounted on the wall? Okay. Um, How many of you have ever read one of these books? How many of you have ever um, read the book, An Elephant's Life? It's a big, thick book. No? Okay. Nobody? How many of you have ever read The Elephant Whisperer? Nobody? These are real books. You can buy them and read them if you want. How many of you have ever read Elephants, Birth, Life, and Death, The World of Giants? It's a good one. Anybody? None of y'all have read that either. Okay. Anybody ever read Modoc, The Greatest Elephant That Ever Lived? That's the subtitle. Anybody ever read that one? Another good one. These are real books. Okay, none of y'all have read any of these books. How many of you have ever seen an elephant out in the wild, not in a zoo, not in a drive through park, but, but not at a circus, but like in Africa, out in the bush, you, you've seen an elephant out in the wild. Raise your hand. Anybody? One, two, three, four, five, keep them up, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so under 20, I count 12 hands, maybe 15 In a crowd this size, that's not many. So is it safe to say we don't have any elephant experts in the room? Y'all haven't read the greatest books about elephants. Most of you haven't even seen one out in the wild. Um, So is anybody here an expert, elephant expert? Nobody. Nobody's got a hand up. Okay, that's what I figured. Same in the first service. So nobody here is an elephant expert. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes for about five seconds. I'm not bringing an elephant in here. Don't worry. (laughs) Just close your eyes for about five seconds. And and when I tell you, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to look at this thing we're going to put on the screen. Okay, everybody, open your eyes and tell me which one is the elephant. D? D? Everybody got it? Did everybody make 100? Okay, not a hard test. Now, none of y'all are elephant experts. None of y'all have read some of the greatest books about elephants that exist today. Most of you have never even seen an elephant out in the wild. But every single one of you knew which one was the elephant. The elephant in the room, so to speak. How did you know? I mean, it was just overwhelmingly obvious, wasn't it? You knew it couldn't be any of the other three by the limited knowledge you have about elephants. Even though you're not an elephant expert, you still got it right because, after all, how could you get it wrong? There's no excuse for not making 100 on that test. It's the same way with the Spirit and our filthy flesh. It's not close, y'all. It's not confusing. You don't have to be a theologian to get it right. It's overwhelmingly obvious. Look at the text. Let's start in Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Now compare that to the flesh, back up into Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, overwhelmingly obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery. Hatred, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, 
and anything similar. In other words, I'm not giving you a full list here. You should know the difference. These are overwhelmingly obvious things. And then he says, I'm warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We don't have to spend a lot of time here because these things are overwhelmingly obvious. If you picked that elephant out on the first try without any help, then you as a believer should have no trouble picking out the difference between what it looks like to walk in the spirit and walk in the flesh. It's not close. These things are opposed to each other. It's overwhelmingly obvious. When you're listening to the Spirit, you can't miss these things. When you're walking in the Spirit, you can't miss these things. When you're in step with the Spirit, you can't mess these things up. It's just overwhelmingly obvious. Now that filthy flesh is going to call you back, and you can make that conscious choice to not walk with the Spirit and to go with the flesh instead, but it's overwhelmingly obvious, and you know what you're doing when you go do it. If we live by the Spirit, let us, church, also keep in step with the Spirit. Point number three, what should we do? So what do we do with this? My encouragement to you is this, we should faithfully follow the Spirit of God. As believers, as God's people, as God's heirs to his kingdom, we should faithfully follow God. We should faithfully follow the Spirit. We need to listen to and we need to faithfully follow the Spirit of God. I love the point that Frost makes in Surprise the World on page 59. He says this. He says, My experience when engaging with my neighbors is that I must open my heart to the Holy Spirit in order to separate truth from untruth, fiction from knowledge, the honorable from the dishonorable, figuring out how best to be an intriguing blessing, a godly presence in community isn't easy. If I'm going to encourage you to bless others and eat with them, it would be irresponsible of me not to also encourage you to listen to the Spirit. That's his whole point in the chapter. If we're going to be people who surprise the world, we're going to need the help of the Spirit of God, who after all has been surprising the world for a really, really long time. He's 100% correct. If we're going to surprise our neighbors, if we're going to surprise the world, if we're going to live out the habits in this book, we have got to faithfully follow the Spirit of God. It's the only way it's going to happen. Paul told the Galatians the same thing near the end of our passage, starting in verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Verse 25 is very challenging. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That that seems like an obvious thing and a simple thing. It's a simple thing to say, simple thing to write, a simple thing to preach about, but it's a hard thing to do when that filthy flesh wants to come and do battle every day. But it's still an overwhelmingly obvious thing, isn't it? If we are the people of God, if we are indwelled by the Spirit of God, then we should follow the Spirit of God. We should keep in step with the Spirit of God. Jesus told us if we wanted to be his disciples, we had to follow him. We had to follow his commands. We have to follow his word. We have to follow his ways. We have to follow his instructions. In Luke chapter 9, for example, it says this in verse 23. Then he said to them all, this is Jesus, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. We know we need to follow Jesus. We talk about following Jesus all the time. But what we forget and what we fail to mention most of the time is this. Faithfully following Jesus means we're also faithfully following the Holy Spirit. If we don't follow the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us, then we can't fully be following Jesus. Jesus said we have to faithfully follow the Spirit, not our filthy flesh. He says it in places like John 14, 25 through 26. I've spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. 
in verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 13, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, the Holy Spirit, he says, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Church, we have to tune in. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit of God every single day, every single moment of every day. We have to realize that he is the one who guides us. He is the one who speaks to us. He is the one who directs our path. He is the one who teaches us. He is the one who warns us. He's the one who empowers us. He's the one who gives us the right words when we don't even know what to say. He does so much if we'll just listen. My encouragement to you who are saved is this. It's simple. Faithfully follow the Spirit of God this week. Sure, bless those three people like we've talked about. Go eat with people like we've talked about. Live questionable lives like we've talked about. Absolutely be in the Word of God as you're faithfully following the Spirit of God. Do all of those things, but make it a point to be in the Spirit, to be in step with the Spirit, to follow the Spirit, to obey the Spirit. If we listen, He's going to help us. And I promise you this, if you're in step with the Spirit, you are going to surprise the world. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. At the beginning of today, I told you that some things just go better together. We all know that's true. They left a few things out of that song, in my opinion. Things that go better together. Things like Oreos and ice cream. Got some amens in the first service on that one. They're spiritual people in that service. Some things just go better together, like a, like a strong cold front and a good pot of chili. Oh, amen. Y'all been saving your amens to the end. I like it. I didn't get an amen about living in the spirit, but I got an amen for chili. Some things just go better together, like a slow Sunday afternoon and a nap. Mm. Or a fire pit with friends and family around it. See, life is full of things that go better together. But I tell you again, there's not a better match made in heaven than you and Jesus, than you and the Holy Spirit. And for those of you here who aren't walking in the Spirit, who don't know the Spirit, who haven't been saved, you haven't repented, you haven't confessed, you haven't believed, for you, I would just say this. You don't have to live separated from God. You don't have to live separated by your sins and your filthy flesh from the Lord. You can be made pure. You can be made holy. And the Spirit of God can indwell your life, can overtake your life, and bring you into a right relationship with God. And that can happen today. I want you to listen. I want us all to listen to Titus chapter 3 before we close. Verses 4 through 7. Titus 3, 4 through 7. There's a message here for those of us who are redeemed, but there's a very clear message for those of you who aren't walking in the Spirit because you don't know Jesus and you haven't repented. Listen to what Paul wrote to Titus. He said, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, praise God, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Is today the day you become a child of God? Is today the day you become an heir to the kingdom of God? Not by the works of righteousness that you can produce in your own life. It'll never get you there. It'll never be enough. It's only by his mercy. It's not by the works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, he sent his son to bring you back into a right relationship with him so you can be indwelled and sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of salvation. If you're not saved, if you're not living and walking in step with the Spirit because He's not in you, if you're not in a relationship with the Lord today, I invite you to confess, to repent, to believe, to be forgiven this hour. Be saved this day. And you're going to discover what many of us have 
that there's nothing in this world that goes better together than you and the Spirit. Would you pray with me? If that's you and you haven't believed and your eyes have been opened and your heart is there, you know who you are. It's overwhelmingly obvious. You can sense and feel the Spirit of God around you, moving inside of you, calling your name. We don't play a bunch of music here, beg you to come to the front or say clever words to get you to raise your hand while nobody's looking. We just ask you to do business with the Lord. If it's you and he's calling you, pray with me. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I've messed things up, gone astray. And so, Lord, today by faith, I ask that you would change me. Lord, by faith, I pray that you would make me new. Lord, today I pray by faith that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for saving me today. Father, as we close today, my prayer is the same for those who have just called on you for the first time and are experiencing their first moments with your spirit living inside of them, as it is for those who have been walking for weeks or months or years or decades. Lord, my prayer is this, that we, your people, the people of God, would walk in the spirit this day and this week. Lord, that we would stay in step with the Spirit, that we would listen to the Spirit. Father, that we would reject the filthy flesh, that we would see those overwhelmingly obvious things for what they are, and that we would just faithfully follow you. No matter where we are in our journey, Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for their families. Lord, I thank you for them making church a priority and your kingdom a priority, your spirit a priority in their life. They are indeed, as we began saying earlier, spiritual people who see spiritual things and seek spiritual things. Lord, and I know that pleases your heart, so I pray you would bless their lives. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We ask your blessing now in our lives, on this church, and on what we've discovered and discussed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.